Father, as we come to your holy word, may you open it to our hearts again. May we understand something new, because we've taken the time to learn from you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, we began a new sermon series, Wheat and the Dove, which is about a section of the Old Testament that's one of those parts that's really hard to to grasp sometimes why on earth does the Bible have this in there and then it repeats it over and over again. It's actually in the, the Bible several times over again. We're calling it the Festival of Weeks, which is one of several names it has in the, in the Old Testament. It's an interesting story. Basically, they, uh, the people of God were supposed to take some of the, the first kernels of wheat that grew and were ready. They would mill them down. They would, they would have liquids, yeast, to dough, bake it. First, two loaves of bread were made with the, the winter crop of wheat, and they, would, they had a little bit of a different growing season. They would, they would plant their cereal crops in the fall. They would, they would grow in the spring and be harvested Mayish, and they would bake these two loaves, and they would take them to Jerusalem, and they would all come before God, and they would put their loaves into a basket, and they would basically sing and, and wave up in the arm their baskets before God, in what they would call a wave offering, and there was quite a bit of movement involved, and they would be singing and doing all of this before God to praise him because of the abundant life he had brought. The abundant life that he had brought. It was a reminder that at one point they had been slaves in Egypt, but now, not only had they been freed, they had been freed to fullness and abundance of life. They would bring one loaf to remind them that they had abundant life. They brought a second loaf to remind them that God had also called them to be a light to the nations, to bring abundant life to people who were not like them. People who were different. It's a good reminder for all of us. In the Festival of Weeks, spends a lot of its effort and time reminding us that being able to come before God and worship wasn't just a matter of people like me being able to come and worship Him. We often have, the church has acted like, and certainly the world has heard the message from the church. The church is for people who dress like me, who act like me, who, who speak like me, who, who might at least act respectably, at least in public. Church is for those people. And we have portrayed and lived like that, and that's certainly the message that the, the world has gotten. And yet, and yet we are called to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to everybody. I think in a lot of ways, a lot of what we're going to talk about today, we, we, we kind of get. I've seen this church step up and, and give such great support to, to missions work and, and particularly to the work that's going on in Congo. And the Festival of Weeks is all about coming before a God who has, who has brought us abundant life and he's brought us abundant life for a reason, because he wants us to bring it to other people. And abundant life, eventually, in the scriptures, as we talk about the festival weeks, transforms in the New Testament, since we call more Pentecost, it's a Greek name for it. And it's about the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit bringing us abundant life. And in many of the lessons we hear, we hear about... You want abundant life? 
You think God's going to bring you abundant life? Absolutely, He wants to. But there are things that we sometimes do to keep God out, to keep God at bay, to keep Him from bringing us abundant life. And sometimes we ask, okay, God wants to bring me this life, but I'm supposed to be full of joy and compassion and life and love. Why does it always feel that way? And sometimes because we do things to block out God. Two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that uh, that uh, we need to learn to trust in His timing, and a lack of trust keeps God out. Last week, we talked about worship, and we talked about kind of the other way. The worship allows us to let God in but through things like, you know, specifically that the Bible talks about giving our money. Instance. And why does it talk about that? Is it because God needs our money? It's no, because we release it because when I love money more than God, I block him out. Or that sometimes I need to give up my emotions. Bad emotions and be able to sing. And, and sometimes worshiping together doesn't allow us to be angry because anger against other people certainly blocks out the things of God. Today we're going to talk about how we treat people and how, if I think myself better than others, if I act like I'm better than others, block out the things of God. There's a story of a lawyer, I don't mean to pick on lawyers, but a lot of these stories pick on lawyers. We don't have any lawyers here, so I think I can get away with it. The story of a lawyer who was driving his fancy car down the street during a time much like it is these days where times were tough. And he was driving down the street and he saw a man who was sitting beside trying to eat grass. Trying to sit beside the road trying to eat grass. And he pulled over and said, what are you doing? He said, I haven't had work for a long time. I am just so hungry. I've got to find something. Surely there is a way to be able to digest this grass. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, come home with me. He said, well, but my wife and my kids are here. I got three kids, or we're all hungry. He said, no problem. We can all fit in the car, come home with me. And, and so he went, he got his kids, he got his wife, they, they got in the car, and they, they thanked this lawyer for being willing to take them into his home, and he said, no problem. I haven't mowed the grass in weeks. I don't think it's a true story. Deuteronomy 16 is one of those places where you find the festival weeks talked about. And part of that passage says this, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And we talked, we, we read this verse last week, and we mostly focused just on that rejoice part. We're going to focus a little bit of a different part of this verse this week. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your town, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you, at the place the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. See, the festival of weeks matters for everyone. There's some symbolism here in this festival week. There's some out and statements. There's a lot of interesting things. One of the things we talked about a couple weeks ago was it was very clear you were supposed to wait seven weeks. You see, there was Passover, and at Passover, they, the plants were little. They were coming up, and they would, they would bring the first leaves off the plants, and they would present them before God and say, Thank you, God. Things are starting to grow. Seven weeks later, the plants aren't so little anymore. They've gotten bigger. Do they have to wait seven weeks? Well, probably not. But different parts of Israel, some places, the, some places the wheat would be really high seven weeks later, some places it would just be starting to grow. It wasn't just a celebration of wheat, it was a celebration of all the crops. Some of the crops would have started by Passover, some of them would be done by then. The point is, you wait seven weeks, everybody should have some of their crops and some of all the crops. 
His worship was to include everyone. It was to include everyone. And it wasn't just to include all different regions, it was to include all different peoples, generations, sons, daughters. Then talks about the, the widowers with the idea of th those who might be older, all generations welcomed in. All different peoples welcomed in. Servants. Servants among many of the other nations around Israel. These were, there were nobodies. You could sell these people. You, you have their lives in your hands. You, you're even allowed to kill them. And yet God says, no. I want them to come. I want you them to worship me. The widows. Fatherless, those who had nothing, those who should be left behind because, well, they don't have much to contribute, do they? Oh, bring them in. Bring them in. The soldiers are the foreigners. Even those who had the least amount, I mean, they can look different, they can speak different languages, they can be people who. Maybe just for traveling through the land. Maybe they had nothing to do with it. Invite them in. Invite them in. Those who are least worthy to come in. So we're supposed to do it. Invite the nations in. I think it's a little bit hard with our partnership with Congo. It's kind of coming to an end right now because we don't have any missionaries in Brazzaville anymore. Last the missionary left last month. Or at the beginning of this month, I guess. Howells, they went off. Why did they go? Because the church in Congo was strong enough to look after themselves. But there was a, a people up in Senegal who needed to know the name of Jesus, who did not know it. So since the church there was strong, well, this becomes a pattern, at least in our denomination of missions, that you know what, if, if the church here is strong, maybe we don't want to create dependencies. Let's move our missionaries somewhere else where they can continue to spread the name of Jesus. We want to invite the nations in. I read earlier from Matthew, the harvest is plentiful. This is all about harvest, the festival of weeks. The harvest is plentiful. Pray for workers to go out and bring in the harvest. We are the crop. People. There's another parable that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Matthew about uh, the crops growing up, but there's a lot of weeds growing up among the crops, and the landowner looks and says, somebody went and deliberately sowed weeds among my crops. Maybe that explains my garden. Um, Jesus, in this story, the harvest owner says, well, let's wait before we deal with the weeds, because we don't want to take the risk of damaging that which is supposed to be growing there, the harvest. And his main concern is for the harvest. He doesn't want to hurt the crops. That's us. That's us. We need to understand that God cares about the harvest. About trying to bring the nations into worship. We are all sinners in need of forgiveness. If any of us looks and says somebody else is not worthy, boy, we're off base. We're off base. Because we are all sinners in need of forgiveness. In a minute we're going to look at a passage that talks about the one of the reasons why this is so important is because the Israelites have been slaves in Egypt. Slaves are pretty much most people's books going to be the lowest. You were the lowest. I came for you. Don't start thinking of yourself as better than anyone else. New Testament says, while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. Do you know what that means? None of us. None of us is better than another. We need to be people who bring the gospel to all peoples. This isn't just about money. It's not certainly about money even in our church. Sometimes we need to find money to give to send missionaries. I've said that uh, in a 
We're going to Congo for the third time in, in the very end of June, beginning in July. Part of our church's responsibility might be releasing me to a couple weeks ministry. It's remembering to pray. It's not just me praying for, for Congo on Sunday mornings, but it's remembering to pray through the course of the week. And even as our partnership comes to an end, continuing to pray. And praying for other parts of the world. Or even just hearing the news with a prayerful attitude. Hearing that there was an earthquake in Ecuador. Praying for it. Listening to the news of places where there's difficulty and trouble and strife. And God, remembering that God is calling us to not... Just listen with fear because there's strife in our world, but to pray because God conquers where we are afraid. And there are some parts of the world that the world is afraid of. But we have a God who's more powerful than that. And we need to be praying for light to win out. Because God wants to release the Holy Spirit into our world in magnificent ways. It's going to happen through us. God cares even among the poor. Leviticus also talks about this festival of weeks, and at the end of its passage it says this, And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after you harvest. You shall leave them for the, for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. In other words, don't harvest right to the edges of your property. Don't take everything out of your garden. If something falls there, just leave it. Somebody else will come along who needs it. Now, I don't think this is necessarily instructions for farming today. Life is a little bit different. But there are some principles that are still there. Leave a little bit to help out the poor. You never know what can happen when we let God work. One of the traditions of the festival weeks was the Jews would pill out the book of Ruth and read it. Now the book of Ruth is an Old Testament book. It's a story of a very sad situation of this woman. She goes off and marries. She leaves Israel. Husband dies, she has two sons, they both die. She goes back to Israel with one of her daughter in laws. They have one way to feed themselves, only one way. And that's this daughter in law, Ruth, who is a foreigner. She doesn't belong in Israel. She shouldn't be there. She should be looked down upon. And she, instead of starving to death, is given the opportunity to do what it says here in Leviticus 23. There's a rich landowner. And um, she follows around those who are doing harvest, and she picks up any little pieces that might have fallen on the ground. And she goes to the edge of the property, and she's allowed to take a little bit. Boaz, as a landowner, he looks at her with compassion. And he kind of tells his workers, do you know what, if you drop an extra little bit, it's okay. Why? Because he has compassion on this woman. And he looks, she starts to look at him as somebody who's very special. And the long and short of the story, they get married eventually. Not only is she allowed to survive, she's actually brought into the family. She's, in fact, brought into the nation of Israel. She's a foreigner. She had no place there. She's brought in, and not just brought in, within a few generations, one of her descendants becomes the king of of Israel. She becomes very central to the history of Israel. In fact, you go enough generations down the line, one of her descendants was born in Bethlehem of Mary and laid in a manger. And you may have heard that story. This woman has no place She's given everything. And as we read that story, we learn that we should be worried about the poor. And sometimes bringing them in changes the world. 
Jesus says, pray for the harvest. You know what he does after that? He tells them, you guys, I want you to pray for the harvest. Pray for workers. Okay, so they start praying. And then do you know what he does? He sends them out to work and go bring in the harvest. He sends them out. We all have a job of reaching out to the poor. Poor can mean various things, obviously economically. It can also be poor physically, poor health, poor spiritually, absolute need of God, poor emotionally, there's a lot of mental health things. We shouldn't look and say that the job of caring for the poor is the job of the government or charities. It's my job. It's my job. We have growing needs in this community. I know just throwing money at it is not going to fix it. We need people who can care. For a lot of people who are going through a community with a lot of hurts, a lot of difficulties, a lot of mental health issues. And I don't know fully how to fix all the problems of our world, but I do know this, God can. And we need to be involved in our community. It wasn't that long ago, even just year and a half ago. I've, of course, been very involved in our local food bank. We used to have two or three people a month go through our food bank. Um, a couple of us here did the hampers up this week. We did five this week alone. More than what we used to do in a month. Helping 16 people altogether. There are great needs in our community. A lot of them are just being met with with food banks and things like that, a lot of it's going to take something bigger than that. That's actually getting to know people and caring for them because a lot of people just need to be loved. And that's really the bottom line of this. There are needs in our community, there are needs in our world, and we're called to care. Why? Because it matters to me. Going back to that Deuteronomy passage, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. In other words, because of where you have come from, these things matter to you. Colossians chapter 3 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Why do we act this way? Because we are God's people, chosen by Him. Why do we help those in need? Because of how God has treated us how God has treated you. He's treated us with compassion when we do not deserve it. Do you deserve any blessings from God? Do you deserve His forgiveness any more than anyone else? Colossians 3 talks first and foremost about humility. We need to be humble. And then goes on to talk about us forgiving. Me laughed what I just finished reading. It says, you know, God forgave you, you better forgive other people. We have compassion because we have been given compassion. We have the same care for people that God has for us. It is easy to become judgmental and look down on other people. It makes myself feel better about myself. Oh, act like that. That group of people. Those people over there. Whenever I kind of get into that attitude, what am I doing? I'm building myself up in my own eyes. I'm not humble. I'm better than other people. And that's what keeps God at bay. Last Sunday, we took some time, as we made a tradition of, of having this, this missions lunch. And, um, Every year, our, we have a national project that's given as a challenge uh, to women in Alliance Church across the country. We've done it in such a way that we take this challenge to the whole church, and the women put on a nice little lunch for us. Last week, we had Serbian food, and what our best guess is to Serbian music was, and hey, it sounded pretty good. Uh, Serbia is a country in Europe that not necessarily looked upon in, in good light. It's often been seen as the aggressor in all the Balkan wars that occurred in the 90s and early 2000s. 
There are people who have been vilified in a lot of ways. They've gone through many wars, and because of that, there's a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. There's a lot of mental health issues. Because of that, there's a lot of alcoholism and drug abuse. It is a nation of great need. And in the second largest city of Serbia, in the city of Novi Sad, an alliance has a work that's going on there, led by Daniel Vera Karanji, who are missionaries who've been there for a long time, who have been living amongst a people who are broken and devastated, bringing love and care, and now what they're trying to do is build a, a, an addiction center for women. They, they have an addiction center, they've got up and running that, that specifically they bring men in, a place for them to spend some time overcoming their addictions. Now they're trying to build a similar center for women there. There are a lot of broken people. And here's a couple that are living their lives amongst broken people without judgment, just bringing the love of Jesus. There are a lot of broken people in our world. You may have been sitting here saying, well, that's fine for them, but I'm feeling pretty broken myself. Maybe that's what we should all be saying, truth be told. That we are all broken people loved by God. And as broken people, we should be loving one another, even in our broken states. Helping others to know the love of Jesus. And you know what? That becomes a secret of actually having abundant life. Then in the midst of my own struggles, I take time to help the nations. I help the poor, wherever their needs are. Whether they be physical, emotional, spiritual, it doesn't matter. That I remember what God has done for me because of what God has done for me, I act for other people. That is a call of God and it unleashes the power of God, the life of God, within my own heart. It's amazing as I do this work for others that God works in me and changes me, and helps me to understand deeper and better how much he loves me. And that's critical. God is compassionate. We need to be in line with his compassion. 